Hi, everybody. Hey. All right, I'm going to have to blast through this fast. So I'm just going to tickle your nostalgia bones with uh, knowing half the battle, what 80s cartoons really teach us uh, more than just the lessons of don't do drugs and don't run away from home. Uh, who remembers this? <laughs> yes, knowing is half the battle, uh, G.I. Joe, Secret Force, to stop Cobra, and they save the day with breakdancing every once in a while. <laughs> you remember that episode? Yeah. And who remembers this? Yeah. Bears that live in the clouds and come down and help you when you're sad is the best thing I've ever heard, right? And then they stop bad guys with tummy lasers that project laser love. That's awesome. <laughs> who remembers this? That's right, Transformers, uh, Autobots wage their battle to destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons and sometimes save the day with breakdancing. <laughs> breakdancing was so important back then. Uh, I'm gonna go fast to the next one's mask. Anybody remember this one? Woo! Vehicles that turn into more awesome vehicles. The guys wear masks, the bad guys have masks that can shoot razor blades and fire and the good guys can lift things and make holograms. That doesn't sound like a fair trade. Who remembers this? Oh, yeah. yeah, or this. Do we remember being confused about Ghostbusters? Filmation Ghostbusters versus the real Ghostbusters. Long story there. What about this? <laughs> or this? And Jim? American Shoujo. And in the first episode, the Misfits showed up on motorcycles shaped like guitars. That is awesome. <laughs> Hulk Hogan's Rocket Wrestling? <laughs> Galaxy Rangers? This is a deep cut. Oh, not as many people. Uh, what about Mo Babies? Yes. CBS Saturday Mornings. What about Hubert? We remember the Hubert cartoon? Oh my gosh, it was part of the Saturday Supercade uh, block of cartoons. Okay, the point is that I heard a lot of enthusiastic responses to some of these cartoons. These things evoke nostalgia and emotions, and for me in particular, I've spent the better part of my career uh, focused on unboxing what this kind of storytelling does to young people and why it carries into our adulthood. And I started a comic series back in 2007 where we were trying to recapture that style of storytelling with brand new characters. I even do a podcast called The Saturday Supercast where me and other cartoonists get together and talk about all these cartoons. I have a two-part episode on Transformers the movie from 1987, not the Michael Bay junk. Uh, and then also, you know, a two-parter on He-Man where I explore some really bizarre uh, theories on the He-Man series. And then I even do a webcomic called Boulder and Fleet, which is my love note to the Filmation He-Man series. And if you really pay attention, you'll see like, oh yeah, he's just ripping off He-Man, but just turning them into animals. So, uh, I wind up talking with a lot of people that introduced me that's like, oh, this is Jersey, he knows a lot about 80s cartoons and he spends a lot of time thinking about them. And then, so of course that brings up the conversation with normal people and they say things like this to me, to which I say, hold up to what? Are you comparing this to Tolstoy? I'm sorry, the thing that you experienced when you were 10 doesn't live up to your 30 year old expectations. <laughs> or they say this, and this part, this one confuses me because I'm trying to think of how these wholesome shows warp their minds. I'm thinking it might have something to do with kid logic, which I'll get to in a second. But I think both of these responses come out of an assumption that runs along these lines. And we've all heard somebody say this once, once upon a time. We don't have to, well, some of us might have said it ourselves. But it always makes you feel like that. Because guess what? They were commercials for toys. We were in on it as children. I remember a 2020 expose where John Stossel was on there saying like, these are just commercials or toys. And as an eight year old, I was like, yeah, so what? They're really cool shows. <laughs> and my parents aren't buying me all the things. So what difference does it make to you, John Stossel? And yeah, there were lessons sort of like inserted in there to make parents happy. But sometimes those lessons could become really, really awesome writing prompts as we will explore. So. Uh, real quick, my job as a cartoonist, I make comic books for a living. One of my jobs is, is to achieve clarity. And I want to just make this distinction real fast between simplicity, simplistic thinking, and clarity. There is a difference between those things. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about as I make my points here is achieving clarity and how 80s cartoons led me to understand writing with clarity. So first point, make your characters register. Make them, make them registered, meaning have people understand who they are and what they're about very, very immediately. And when we watch these old shows, you can summarize a lot of the characters very uh, simply. Not simplistically, but simply, right? Uh, Duke is just a really, really good guy. Alpine is just a smart mouth, and you know, Bazooka was just like a silly-headed guy. And then we had characters like Shipwreck. Everybody remembers Shipwreck, right? He was like the Jack Nicholson character who was kind of a womanizer, had a, a parrot on his shoulder that he always fought with. Transformers, Starscream, every time Megatron fell down, Starscream was like, I'm the new leader, right? Megatron's in the bathroom, I'm in charge now. He was the treacherous narcissist, and that was the long and short of his character, right? So the thing that this taught me was that one sentence, if you can summarize your character in one sentence, you've got something there. This is from the Transformers series from 2001 called Transformers Robots in Disguise. And one of my favorite characters ever was Skybite. 
This guy, by, as described by one of the actors on the show, was a Shakespearean actor who was forced to play second banana. What a marvelous, <laughs> evocative description for a character. Because one, it, it, it points to all the cool storytelling things you can uh, you know, witness with this guy. It's always fun to watch somebody's dignity be stripped away. But two, it's relatable. We all have taken ourselves seriously at one point or another, and then somebody has come along to say, guess what, you're not as important as you think you are, dummy. And you go, oh, wah. Right? So Skybite was awesome, and that's a great way to sum him up. Uh, my, okay, let's have our moment. You all made your brony joke. Now we can move on. In the opening of the show, the characters sing a song about what to expect in the show. We'll talk more about openings of shows in a second, but they all address what their key personality trait is in the opening of the show. Big adventure, tons of fun, a beautiful heart, faithful and strong, sharing kindness, it's an easy feat, and magic makes it all complete, right? So they're front ending. <laughs> Thank you. The toys came with file cards that told you what to expect from the characters. So yes, it's cool that I got a truck that could turn into a robot, but also the truck that turns into a robot is different than the ambulance that turns into a robot. They all have different tastes and different personalities. And that's a great jumping on point for role playing and the shows built on that and expanded upon it. So you might say, oh, two, two dimensional characters. You can't exp explore any kind of complex or interesting storytelling. You can't explore growth of these characters. Who here's watched Avatar The Last Airbender? A few of us, we know who this guy is. Who is this guy? It's Zuko. So Zuko, I would submit, has a one-sentence character description, and it is this. Whoops. He's in search of honor, and they, in the three seasons, they explore it in three different ways. He starts out in search of honor to reclaim his father's affection, then he, explore, he is in search of honor to redeem himself in the eyes of his uncle, and then, in spoilers, final season, he is in search of honor to help the good guys. It's a one-sentence description that has three different inflections, and he is a very complex character, I would submit. So, in other words, vibrant is not the same thing as two-dimensional. So, visually vibrant, yes, as a cartoonist, I have to think about uh, physical design of characters. And in my comics classes, and I'll go through this very fast, four common tools of cartooning, we'll just talk about shape and color real quick. In shape, round shapes make us think of babies, make us think of non-threatening things, teddy bears, cute, cuddly things. Square things make us think of structural shapes, uh, you know, uh, sturdy shapes, stable. Triangles make us think of uh, dynamic shapes or dangerous shapes, shark teeth, right? And color, when we think of warm colors, we think of passionate colors, and we think of cold colors, and aloof colors, and mysterious colors. Let's look at these guys again. Forget everything you know about them. Look at what the designers did with shape and color, right? Starscream is covered in points. Optimus Prime is red, white, and blue. Oh, say, can you see? And he's all squares. And he's got an ax, yes. But the, even the ax isn't as pointy as Starscream's wings, fingers, and toes, right? So we can take this even to modern character design, right? Perry the Platypus is a rectangle. Doofenshmirtz's his head, look at that. So point two, tell your story clearly. And this I'm gonna have to go through really fast and I will not belabor this point, but every show was around 21 minutes, 22 minutes. Had commercial breaks. Had a parade of characters and exciting new vehicles that they had to trot on screen. Tell your parents, kids, buy this new thing, right? So that meant you had to be super economical in your storytelling. So this is an episode I would recommend you check out later on online, uh, The Burden Hardest to Bear. The, 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 the crux of it is that Optimus Prime, who was leader after Optimus Prime in the 1987 movie, Optimus died, sorry, spoilers, but he becomes leader. He uh, is tired of being leader. He loses the matrix of leadership, the thing that makes him the leader. The Decepticons take it. They give it to uh, this guy named Scourge, who puts it inside himself, turns into a monster. Hot, Hot Rod, who was once Optimus Prime, wakes up and says, hey, I don't have to be leader anymore. This is awesome. Midlife crisis. I'm going, you know, driving around. And Scourge starts wrecking up the place. Hot Rod hides out in a dojo so he doesn't have to go fight people because that's where, where else would you hide from your friends? <laughs> and the samurai master explains to him, like, you know what? When you grow up, you have responsibility. You have to live up to that responsibility. And the responsibility owns you as much as you own it. So you got to go back out there and fight. Rodimus goes back, fights Scourge, gets the Matrix back, and becomes uh, the leader of the Autobots again. <laughs> the third thing I learned, pitching. I don't think anybody here has ever tried to pitch something or a story or a product. But summarizing something very succinctly, doing that elevator pitch is super, super hard. Every one of these cartoons, even modern cartoons, had a 30 second pre-roll pitch to get you signed on to watch the thing. Here's the exciting story you gotta watch. I'm gonna go through a very familiar one that we probably all remember, and I'll go through it really fast, and then we're gonna touch a few points of it. So, he, man, and the masters of the universe. I'm Adam, Prince of Eternia, and defender of the secrets of Castle Grayskull. This is my friend Cringer, my, or my fearless friend. He's not really fearless, look at him. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to me the day I held off my magic sword and said, by the power of Grayskull, and then what does he say next? By the power of Grayskull. Yes, then he points his sword at his cat and blasts it with a laser. The cat turns into a super cat. He says, Cringer became the battle cat. And I became He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. He punched the screen. Only three others share this secret. Our friends, the sorceress, men at arms, 
and Orko. Together we defend the secrets of Casper Grayskull from the evil forces of Skeletor. Can anybody do the laugh? <laughs> you can do better than that. You've had a lot to drink tonight. <laughs> All right, so anyway, so Skeletor laughs. We see his ghostly face, and then it says He-Man one more time. We get the title card again. So here's the interesting thing. We got everything we need to know in terms of plot, in terms of characters, and in terms of genre, all in that 30 second pre-roll. And the most important thing of all is that, you know, we see sword and sorcery, we see giant cat, these are right around, the guys in furry underpants, it's probably some kind of barbarian story. But then we got sorceress, okay, well she's got like an eagle carcass on her body, maybe it's gonna be some kind of Conan thing. But then we get to, we get to man arms in this future suit shooting lasers out of his hands. Wait a second, is this sword and sorcery or is this science fiction? And then we get to Orko and the cute guy shows up who eight year olds go, oh, he's neat. And 13 year old boys go, ugh, I feel uncomfortable. So we know, <laughs> that's a whole nother talk. But we know that what to expect in terms of genre, we know it's gonna be a fantasy story with science fiction elements and it's gonna be for little kids all in that 30 second pre-roll. That is an amazing pitch. And a lot of these shows do a good job of it. Five, uh, number point four is the limitations breed creativity. So as was mentioned, I teach comic classes and a lot of my students, when I start giving them a lot of parameters and the lessons, they say, oh, you're stifling my creativity. I'm supposed to be free and express myself as an artist and there should be no limitations of what I do. But many, many creative people will tell you that it's the limitations that force you into creative choices to solve the problems. And a lot of these writers brought into these toy lines and they said, write a show around this thing that has a playability factor, make the playability factor a part of the plot and make interesting characters while you're at it so the kids won't realize that this is a commercial, right? <laughs> this is a fascinating type of writing, in, in my opinion. So let's look at a couple examples. Does anybody here remember Wheeled Warriors? Yeah, a couple of us. <laughs> Wheeled Warriors, as a toy, before the show came out, the chief playability feature was it was future vehicles that you could take apart and reassemble into other vehicles. And the big catchphrase was stack and attack. You take two vehicles, stack them on top of each other, put all the weapons all over them, and you've got a super ve uh, vehicle. There was no figure. There were figures, but they didn't have personalities. So the writers come on and they had to write a show around this thing. How do we write something around stack and attack? So they basically lifted a lot of things from Star Wars, but they introduced some really cool MacGuffins like this thing called the Magic Root, and then Jace, the young man, has one half of the root, his father has the other half of the root. These evil plant creatures who are born of the Magic Root called the Monster Minds, who can turn into cars, are chasing after them. Now I know that's weird. <laughs> but have you ever heard of a science fiction story where talking plant creatures turn into cars to try to kill you? I haven't. I mean, David the Trippins is kind of close, but. Anyway, that's at least original. Uh, another one I've become fascinated by recently is Sky Commanders. You can find this on YouTube. Does anybody here remember Sky Commanders? And it's a little bit of a deep cut. The chief playability feature of uh, Sky Commanders was zip line. You got a guy hooking his back rope, whoot, that's it. <laughs> I challenge anybody in this room to build an interesting story around that idea. <laughs> But what the writers did, this is Hanna-Barbera, man. They weren't even known for doing action stuff. They came up with this idea of like, okay, well, we need a MacGuffin. We'll come up with this thing called Theta-7. Theta-7 is this amazing element that can make continents splash out of the ocean and just pop up. So deep in the South Pacific, a tumultuous new continent has arrived, uh, has arrived, uh, spawned by the uh, unstable element Theta-7. I assure you that if any of our governments heard of an element that could make continents pop out of the ocean, they'd be fighting like crazy over it. So there's your great MacGuffin. So now you got your teams coming in to go capture the Theta-7, but this, this continent that pops out keeps moving, like a mountain might pop up today and then drop into the ocean tomorrow. So you can't use tanks on it, you can't use rock climbing skills on it, and you can't use planes because the, because the mountain range is always changing, the air currents are uh, too dangerous. So they have to use revolutionary gravity lock and laser cable technology to traverse the ever-changing terrain. That may not be Tolstoy. But it's a creative solution to a problem, and the show is actually pretty watchable. <laughs> Subpoints. Something that we forget when we're making things. We take ourselves seriously, we got too much dignity, we forget that we can use whimsy. Uh, we forget about kid logic. Who here has ever heard of Axe Cop? Anybody? Uh, Axe Cop. Axe Cop, yes. Ri originally written by a five-year-old, right? And that was part of the charm of it, was the unfiltered worldview of a child telling stories about a cop with an axe who stops people, right? <laughs> Silverhawks, I submit, is the finest example of kid logic in a cartoon series. It's basically the untouchables in deep space with every kind of supervillain you can ever imagine, and the cops have cybernetic suits with bird themes to them. It's a very, very weird show, but it's so interesting how they merged all these things together. We have guys like Monstar as the main bad guy, and I love that name, Monstar, because he's a monster in outer space, of course it'd be Monstar. And, and he, when he gets a, a, a beam from the Monstar on him, he turns into this big armored dude and he can ride around on a giant space squid. And then there's characters like 
hardware, who's like a goblin who can make any kind of weapon in the world. Melodia with the keytar there. When she plays the keytar, evil laser notes come out of it and destroy things. It's a fantastic show full of terrific kid logic. And it reminds us that when you stop and sit there and say, how does Superman fly anyway? That's a wonderful four o'clock in the morning pot conversation. <laughs> but you're sucking the life out of the thing when you start asking those kinds of questions. And we should allow ourselves to be whimsical and Neil Gaiman will back me up on this. You get to do whatever you want. <laughs> you get to do what you want to do in your stories as long as you stand by the thing. Okay, finally, last thing I learned, and I feel just as strongly about it as Steve Martin did. <laughs> These shows had morals, and they get made fun of for having morals, but there's another way of thinking about it. But after all, I'll just back this up and justify this real quick. A friend of mine named Dan Michigan, a comic book writer, he wrote Superman, Wonder Woman, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, he once said that superhero stories are dress rehearsal for adulthood, right? Because when you're a little kid and you look at adults, they have this amazing power. I remember sitting in the passenger seat of the car with my dad. My dad's driving, I'm like, how do you keep within the lines, <laughs> right? To me, it was amazing. My dad was like, I don't know, I just do it, that's all. But what superheroes point to is someday you're gonna have that amazing power and you're gonna have to make all sorts of choices. You're gonna be able to change the world when you get that power, right? And so superheroes are a safe way for kids to explore those choices and those things, right? That's why Spider-Man, great power, great responsibility, and so on. So in other words, these stories have points, these stories have arguments, these stories have aboutness. Now, some of the shows had back-ended some you know, didactic lesson stuff like don't do drugs, kids don't run away from home. But the filmation shows, especially He-Man, um, and I could talk all day about He-Man. So have me back again to do a whole talk on He-Man. Uh, <laughs> those shows, the, the moral was actually a summary of the point of the episode. So going back to that Rodimus Pry and Transformers episode, what was that story about? What was the aboutness? What was the argument? It was about a young man who comes into his full responsibility, finds out this sucks, I gotta make choices every day. And then uh, he tries to run away from it, then the old samurai guy says, you can't run away anymore. He says, all right, I won't. And so, yes, the, you could call it a moral, but you could also call it an argument or an aboutness or a point. So with that, I will close, and I thank you very much for your time. Okay, bye.